Last Lord's Day we talked about what is Bible inspiration. This morning we're going to talk about God's four just judgments. Four just judgments. Let's begin by reading verse number one together. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves rich destruction. Those are false prophets. Uh, the prophets here, uh, pseudo prophetes is what it is, one who is acting the part of a prophet, he ushers falsehoods. He utters falsehoods under the name of the divine prophecies. We have modernists today that do the same thing. False prophets. Slick prophets that pretend to order the word of God, but they do not. And then uh, false teachers among you. And we've got false teachers among us even today. Not just when Peter's day. Uh, notice who privately uh, will bring in Daniel Harrison. Uh, very secretly, surreptitiously, coming in cleverly and taking over whole churches. That's what they've done in our church, churches today in this country. And bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. And bring them to some swift destruction. Uh, that denying the Lord that bought them, uh, this is one of the reasons why I believe in the unlimited atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ bought even these heretics. Well, they haven't accepted him. But he paid for their sins on the cross of Calvary. That's what this word bought means. And so unlimited atonement, and they deny the Lord who died for their sins. Many people today have that same feeling as we know. Uh, false prophets in Matthew 7, 15, the Lord Jesus said, Beware of false prophets. which come to you in sheep's clothing. Why? They look like sheep. Inwardly ravening wolves. Matthew 24, 11, Many false prophets shall arise. The Lord Jesus prophesied that and shall deceive many. We have so many people deceived by the false prophets of modernist apostates today. In Matthew 24, 24, there shall also arise false Christs and false prophets. Shall show great signs and wonders. There's a signs and wonders uh, type of things that they have in the charismatic movement. Insomuch as if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Charismatic Pentecostal movement. In Luke 6, 26, the Lord Jesus again. Woe unto you, for all men shall speak well of you. All men well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. They spoke well. Uh, everybody that speak well of us, if we stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, people, sinners are going to be against us. And some saints are even against us. Some of them, depending on our doctrines. Right? In Acts 13, verse 6, uh, Paul and Barnabas went from Antioch. They found a certain sorcerer. He's called a false prophet. Uh, Bar Jesus was his name. And uh, he's a false prophet. In 1 John 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try, test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are got out all over the world. Why try the spirits? And in Revelation 16, 13, out of the mouth, talks about the, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. The false prophet, there's a satanic trinity. And in Revelation 19, 20, the beast was taken, with him the false prophet, and so on. And then in Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil that deceived him, he's the first trinity of devil. The devil that deceived him was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. That's the, that's the end of the, tribulation, of the millennial reign. Where the beast, that's the second member of the false trinity of Satan, and the false prophet are Satan, the beast, the false prophet. Notice that tense of that word. They are... Now they were cast into the beginning of the, of, the, of the millennial reign, at the end of the tribulation. And for 1,000 years, they still are there. That's eternal suffering in hell. No question about that. Then false teachers even here will bring heresies in Acts 24, 14. Uh, after the way which they call heresy, we worship the God of our fathers. The Christians were called heretics by the Jews because they didn't go along with Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11, 19, there must also be heresies or holdings or different teachings uh, among you. Why? That they which are approved may be made manifest unto you. Certain heresies. So let the heretics go so that the ones that are approved may be manifest. And then in Galatians 5 and verse 20, part of the works of, these, of the flesh, some 17 works of the flesh, one of them is heresies. That word hierarchy means to hold something 
uh, either true or false. It depends on the context. If you hold that which is true, that's a good holding. Uh, but if you hold that which is false, that's a bad holding. And that was a heretic that we usually call heresy at that time. Uh, then the, the only uh, word that the Lord had bought them in 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul says, you are bought with a price. Those of us who are genuinely saved are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Then in 1 Corinthians 7.23, Paul mentions to the church of Corinth again, you are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. So these heretics were bought, they didn't accept Christ, but they were bought, he died for their sins. Uh, swift destruction. In Psalm 103, verse 4, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. The Lord is able to redeem our lives from destruction. Uh, who crowneth thee with loving kindness. In Matthew 7, verse 13, the Lord Jesus says, Enter ye in the straight gate, very narrow. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. The wide gate of destruction, those who deny the Lord Jesus Christ and don't receive him as their Savior. Very wide is that gate. In Matthew, uh, rather Romans 9, verse 22, uh, What if God willing to show his wrath shows of much suffering, long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Those that are unsaved, non Christians, are fitted for destruction in hell. And Philippians 3, verse 19, I talk about the unbelievers whose end is destruction. That's hellfire, the end. And 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 9, uh, talks about these unbelievers again, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. It's a great st statement about that, but we've got to be careful of false teachers and false prophets. They're around us today. They're on television programs. They're on the Internet. They're in churches all around. Let's read verse number 2 together. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Notice, not just a few. The pernicious ways of the false teachers and false prophets are many. Multitudes. That's why we have huge churches that are just led by false teachers and false prophets. They're pernicious ways. Apoleia. Uh, they're destructive and ruinous ways. That's what that word means. Notice, by reason of whom... Because of these false teachers, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Those people in the false world, they say, you people are fundamental Bible believing Christians, you're crazy, you don't, you're too ancient and you don't hold the truth. And they speak evil of faithful Bible believing Christians. These false teachers do. They poke fun at those of us who stand for the word of God, unflinchingly. And that's a very important verse, and it's certainly a true verse, now by this, these false teachers will speak evil. Let's read verse number 3 together. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Now notice, through covetousness, these false teachers are the itch for more. They want more what it is. So because of that, with feigned words, that word feigned, uh, it's, a, it's a word that means plastic, it's not really genuine, uh, it's molded and formed like from clay, just a more feigned, molded words, make merchandise of you. What does that mean? Well, they're covetous, they want more money. So their word for make merchandise means do something for gain. If they can silence the fundamental Bible-believing churches and tell their people, come to us, they'll get their money. They get their merchandise, and with covenants and feigned words, they make merchandise of you, the believers that are sound in the faith. And so this is the meaning of what he's talking about here, and that's what they do. Uh, they trounce true believers so they get more people for themselves and their own churches. Feigned words, merchandise, whose judgment now a long time lingereth not, their damnation slumbereth. They will be judged as the Lord will see fit to do that. Uh, as far as covetousness is concerned, uh, moreover, in Exodus 18, verse 21, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God. These are leaders that Moses was to appoint. Even men of truth, hating covetousness. Hating covetousness. 
place them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. Leaders have to be no covetousness, no desire, more and more and more, otherwise they're going to be very seriously flawed. In Psalm 119.36, Incline my heart, David prayed, to thy testimony, to thy word, not to covetousness. So even in David's day, in the Old Testament day, there was an itch for more. More of this and more of that, to thy word, thy testimony. In Proverbs 28, verse 16, verse 16, The prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor. He that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. Uh, if you're covetous and you want more and more and more, you've got to work and work and work to get more and more and more. But he that hateth covetous will live longer. Because you're not out trying to earn another dollar or two dollars or whatever the, the currency. In Jeremiah 6 and verse 13, from the least of them, Jeremiah says to his people that are sinners, the least of them to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even as the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. What a terrible day that Jeremiah had. And speaking to Judah, and in captivity for 70 years because they were given to covetousness and wanting more of this world's goods. In Habakkuk 2, in verse 9, Habakkuk the prophet says, Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, and they may be delivered from the power of evil. Uh, hateth evil covetousness. There's an evil covetousness. We certainly say, Lord, give us the things that we need, but Covetousness, more than ever, onward and evil covers it. Then in Mark 7, verse 22, Lord Jesus talks about the various things that come out of our hearts, the heart of man. One of them is covetousness. And then in Luke 12, verse 15, yeah, the Lord Jesus again, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists consist of God in the abundance of things which he possesses. That's a very good verse. Our life doesn't consist. All our goods and kindreds can go, but our, if we're saved and generally born again, that's what's important. A man's life and a woman's life and a boy's and girl's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Then Ephesians 5 and verse 3, uh, Paul says to the church at Ephesus, certain things you're to not be once among, named among you as saints. <coughs> Fornication, and uncleanness, covetousness is one of the things. Let it not be once named among you as become a saint. We're not to be covetous. It's, it's just more and more be content with the things that you have. Uh, Colossians 3 and verse 5, again to the church of Colossae, Paul says from prison, mortify your members which are upon the earth. Put to death our members. we got ten of them. <clears throat> two hands, two eyes, two ears, two feet, one mouth, one heart. There are ten of these members of our bodies. More to put them to death, to be controlled by the Lord. Uh, and then it says, which upon earth. And then he names some of these <coughs> these things that are wrong. Covetousness, which is idolatry, is named as something we should mortify on earth. And then in First Thessalonians 2, in verse 5, Neither at any time use we flattering words, Paul wrote, the Thessalonian Christians, for neither for a cloak of covetousness are God is witness. So he wasn't a, he didn't have a cloak of wanting more things. He worked his way along, as you know, he's a tent maker. Some churches gave him funds and others did not. Then in Hebrews thirteen, verse five, Paul says in that verse, Let your conversation, your way of life, your manner of life be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. That's a very important verse, Hebrews 13, 5. There are damnation slumbers. Only 11 times damnation is mentioned, but in Matthew 23, 33, Lord Jesus talked to the Pharisees, and he said, the serpents, well, that wasn't politically correct, was it? The generation of vipers or snakes, that's not politically correct. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? The Lord Jesus Christ was a hellfire and brimstone preacher. He told these Pharisees they're not going to escape the damnation of hell. In John 5, 29, they shall come forth, they that have done good, those that are under the resurrection of life, they have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. Two resurrections 
and the Lord Jesus is going to be the one in charge of the judgment seat of Christ for believers and the great white throne judgment for the unsaved. Let's read verse number 4 together. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them under the chains of darkness to be reserved unto the judgment. The first judgment of the four is judgment of angels. The angels that, that sin, those that followed Satan, the devil demons that followed Satan, God's going to judge. That's a just judgment number one. Now in Genesis 6, we read about the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. They took them wives of all that they chose. I believe the sons of God, there are angels, fallen angels that cohabited with, with, with women. And I say that because of Job 1.6. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. They're angels, sons of God, before the Lord. In Job 2, verse 1, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, again, angels before the throne of God. In Job 38, 4, uh, in verse number 7, uh, where were you when the morning stars sang together? All the sons of God shouted for joy, angelic beings. Now many people think that's different. They don't agree with that in Genesis 6. I believe it was angelic fallen angels. And uh, there were giants in the earth, Nephilim, fallen ones, uh, because of this cohabitation of the fallen angels with, with women. And giants in the earth, after that, the sons of God uh, came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Well, God destroyed them uh, because of that. But this is what the angels, the sons of God, did. In Matthew 25 and verse 41, uh, then shall he say also on those on the left hand. Remember, there's a right hand and a left hand. The sheep on the right, the goats on the left. You say those on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. False angels, fallen angels, wicked angels that followed Satan. That's what hell is prepared for. Not for people. But if people reject the Savior that can get them out of there, they go to the place prepared for the devil and his angels. And 1 Corinthians 11, verse 10. For this God is out the women to have power on her head because of the angels. She should be submissive to her husband so that the angels don't come upon them like they did back in Genesis 6. I think that's what the meaning is there. And uh, the power on the head is the proper hair and so on. In Jude 6, the angels which kept not their first estate, those are the angels of the fall of Satan, but left their habitation, he hath reserved to everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. The angels are under the just judgment of God because of their sin. Those that followed Satan and said, I will be like the Most High God. Now, as far as judging angels, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Save born again Christians. At the judgment of the angels, the Christian believers, the resurrected bodies, will be with the Lord Jesus to judge those angels. In Revelation 20, in verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. That's at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. Remember, he's, he's loosed for a season. He's chained up for a thousand years. At the end, he's loosed. And the Lord says at the end of that time, he'll be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the lead, the lead angel, Satan, will be in hell for eternity in the lake of fire and he's there right now. Let's read verse number 5 together. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the God. This is just judgment number 2 out of 4. The first, the just judgment of angels. The second, the judgment of the whole world in the flood. A lot of people don't believe it's a universal flood. They think that they go up, the water could be as high as the mountain, all of a sudden, to stay up there. No, it, it levels off. Water levels off. It's a universal flood. Genesis 6, 5 to 8. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. It's caused by these sons of God, these angelic cohabitation with women. Giants and all kinds of wickedness and evil were prevalent. He saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, but every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He repented the Lord that he even made man. And then in verse 7, the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things, the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace 
in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6, 17, Behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Not just a temporal or small, little, tiny flood, but a universal flood. I will destroy all flesh when there is a breath of life under the heaven. And everything that is on the earth shall die. Everything. The whole earth. And in Genesis 7, 21, And all flesh died and moved upon the earth. Not just a, a, a simple flood, a local flood, but a universal flood. Both the fowl, the cattle, and the beast, of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, every man, every man, universal flood, all in whose nostrils were the breath of life, and all that was in the dry land died. This is clear that it's a universal flood. It's a judgment by God on a wicked, sinful, cursed people. Every living substance, it says, was destroyed, upon which was the face, on the face of the earth, both man and cattle, creeping things, the fowls of the heavens, destroyed upon the earth. Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And God gave pairs of two, and some pairs of seven pairs, to be preserved. And then in Matthew 24, 37, what's the Lord Jesus have to say about the universal flood? As the days of Noah were, so shall be the days of the Son of coming, Son of Man. And uh, they were marrying and giving in marriage till the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, the next words, and took them all away. All. The Lord Jesus Christ believed in a universal flood, as the Old Testament teaches, as we believe. And then Luke 17, 26. Again, he said, as it was, it was in the days of Noah, so shall be in the days of the sun coming of the Son of Man. We got wickedness even today all over, just like and he wondered the Lord doesn't bring another flood, but he said, no, no more floods. But the rainbow, and there's going to be judgment from the sky, but not the floods. And he says, as it was in the days of Noah, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, and were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them partially, all. Destroyed them all. <coughs> Lord Jesus, again, universal flood. That's the second righteous judgment. The wickedness of man was so great. And all this, all these in cohabitation, men with, with satanic angels, what was going to be where the Lord Jesus came? He couldn't come through that nation. He couldn't come through that. He'd be polluted. And the Lord God knew that he had to send a Savior one day that had to be pure. And so he took Noah and his family, put him in the ark and spared him, and knocked out all the other ones. These angelic angels, these giants, these Nephilim, these fallen ones in the earth. Let's read verse number 6 together. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and their ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them a sample of those that should live on God. God judgment number 3 out of 4, Sodom and Gomorrah. We're living in the United States of America in Sodom and Gomorrah, where a president, whom I think is a homosexual himself, uh, with in Chicago and the bathhouses, it was a notorious thing. He knew what he was. He was believe what you want. I believe he was married to a man named Michael Robinson, football player. I'll show you his picture if you want. Just exactly like his wife, Michelle. He's Michael. Anyhow, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was a judgment of God. In Genesis 13 and verse 10. The Lot lifted up his eyes. Behold, the men of the plain of Jordan. It was well watered before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the third judgment of God. In Genesis 13, 13, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. In Genesis 18, 20, uh, The Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous. God is just in judging Sodom and Gomorrah. You know that Lot came out and his wife started, but then turned back and was killed. A couple of daughters. Uh, thus, in Genesis 19:24, the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone of fire from the Lord. He overthrew those things, all the plain. And then in Genesis 19, verse 28, He looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. Behold, a smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And then in Genesis 19, Lot went out of Zoar and uh, dwelt on the mountain, and his two daughters with him, and so on. And uh, notice also verse 31, the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, 
There's not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of earth. So they made their father drunk. And one daughter went and lay with him, has a baby by him, another daughter. What did they learn in this instance? In Sodom and Gomorrah. The wickedness was passed even upon the daughters that left. God, God let them out of there, but they learned the wicked, evil ways. And we have that sin today, many, many fold. And then in Luke 17, 29. But the same day the Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone and destroyed them all. I mentioned that earlier. And so the second one was the, the third one rather, the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah was the third judgment, just judgment of God. Let's read verse number seven together. And delivered, just God, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Boy, it doesn't seem to me like he's just, but God says he's just, so God must have seen something I, in Lot that I couldn't see. Wicked, wicked man, and a lot of Christians that are maybe born again, but they're living for the flesh, the world, the devil, and you don't even know whether they're Christians. God says he's just, he's got to be just. God saw him, and he had faith, but his works were horrible. <clears throat> it says he's vexed, that is, wrongly influenced by the filthy conversation, the filthy way of life. Asagea is the word. Unbridled lust all around him. Excess, licentiousness, lasciviousness, wantonness, outrageousness. Shamelessness. Uh, this is what Lot had all around him. And it influenced him. And he learned the sins of the Sodom and Gomorrah with his two daughters that later. Uh, in Genesis 19.4, uh, before the men lay down, here some men came after some, some angels that went into the city of Lot. Uh, and even the men of Sodom, after these visitors lay down, the men of Sodom compassed the house round about, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. They called unto Lot and said, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Sexual relations is sodomy. This gal, Virginia Mollencott, wants to redefine sodomy in Sodom and Gomorrah. She says, Oh, sodomy is just, just unkind to people. No, they're more than unkind. They had sexual relations, men and women, women and women, women, they were sodomites. And that's where these men of Sodom went when the Lord sent his angels to the city to, to talk to tell Lot to get out of here. That's what the message was. And they wanted to know where the men, that they could know them, have sexual relations with them. Lot went out the door, said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Little mealy mouth, carnal fellow that God calls just. That's unjust. What he suggested, behold, in Genesis 19:8, I have two daughters. There's not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out to you and do eat to them as good as your eyes, whatever's in your eye. What kind of justice is that? He's a, he's a miserable. Maybe God saw in him faith and righteousness, but no, nobody could see any righteousness in that action to send his, his girls out there. In Luke 17, 28, likewise as was in the days of Lot, uh, so will be the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. God destroyed. So Lot is called just. Here, let's read verse number 8 and see something, something else about Lot. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So here again he's called righteous. Twice just and now righteous. But we have to take the word of God truthfully and honestly. But as we look at it, we don't want to have our righteousness and justice follow the actions of Lot. God may see his faith, just like a lot of people that are maybe justified by genuine faith in Christ, are saved, but living for the devil. This is a horrible state. Right? Dwelling among them, because remember, he chose. Abraham gave him the choice. Too much for our cattle. If you take one way, I'll take another. But chose Sodom and Gomorrah. The sight of the eye. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So he went down there. Dwelling among them. Notice also in seeing and hearing. We've got to be careful what we see and what we hear. Whether it's on the radio, whether it's on television, whether it's on the internet, whatever it is, reading newspapers, seeing, he vexed his righteous soul. That's another word for vexed. There's two words. This is batsanidzo. And it means to vex with grievous pains of body or mind. If he's just, his mind was vexed. It was pained. Uh, it means to torment, to be harassed, to be distressed. It speaks of those who at sea are struggling with a headwind. Headwind after them, they try to struggle to keep going. 
That's righteous life. That's a righteous man. Struggling. Vexed. His righteous, and again, righteous soul. From day to day with an unlawful deeds. In Genesis 19.4, uh, the men of Sodom compassed the house round about. We said this before. So where are the men that came in? And uh, we may know them. And so this man went out to the door and he says, right. Then in Genesis 19, verse 8, he has two daughters. What a terrible suggestion. We mentioned that earlier. Genesis 19, verse 30. So Lot went up out of Zor and dwelt in the mountain, his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zor. He dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And there's what I say, the firstborn said, Our father is old, not a man, to come into us. So they got their father drunk and had a child by both the older daughter and the younger daughter. Where did they learn this? In Sodom. In Sodom. In Sodom, apparently it was all right. It was all right apparently for Noah to, to drink and be drunk. Let me scoot to, to uh, Lot. Lot, rather. Not Noah. Uh, Lot was learned that too, probably, how to drink. And he got himself so badly drunk he couldn't even tell what was up. Didn't know it was his own daughter. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, Be not deceived. We know that one. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Communication associations, that's what that word means. You have evil associations all around you. What you see and what you hear, it's corrupting of our good manners and good faith. That's what Lot had the problem with. He had evil associations, wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it corrupted his manners. And if you and I stick close with unbelievers and raunchy people and horrible people and swearing people and wicked, adulterous and fornicating people, various and sodomite people, and learn their ways, our manners are going to be corrupted. God does not want our manners corrupted in any way. Let's read verse number 9 together. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So here's the fourth just judgment. The, the first of the angels. The second was the flood of Noah. The third was Sodom and Gomorrah. Now uh, the fourth. Now, if God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, when is he going to judge the United States of America or England or these other nations that believe on Sodomite marriages, two men and two women marrying? in the state of New Jersey, where we live, where this church is, has justified these marriages. Our mayor, right at this time, uh, he married them almost the next day, three or four of them, I don't know, maybe five of them, right there in the courthouse, or wherever he is in his house, his uh, office. Uh, when is God going to judge us here? I don't know. You say, well, it's not quite as bad as Son of Gomorrah. Well, that's, that may be true now, but what's it going to be? Who knows? Uh, but this verse number nine, talks about the final judgment, the fourth judgment, just judgment, the judgment of unsaved people in hell. He knows, first of all, how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And he delivered, again, it's called godly. Just, righteous, righteous, godly. Lot is called all those things. And I say, we've got to believe the Lord. We can't change his word. But look at his actions. Who would have thought that that guy was righteous or holy or just? deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust, those that are lost and unsaved for the day of judgment to be punished. As far as God's deliverance, praise God he does be able to deliver us. In Galatians 1 and verse 4 Paul wrote, who gave himself for our sins, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, sins of the whole world, not simply the elect, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. The deliverance of our Savior. He wants to deliver us from the present evil world by the will of God and our Father. And He can deliver us. And by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, He will continue to deliver us if we're willing to be delivered. And some Christians perhaps that don't want to be delivered from this wicked world. They want to be worldly and sinful and corrupt and uh, be fellows, fellow servants of the, with the wicked people and be just one of the boys and one of the girls. They don't want to be different. And uh, we've got to pray that our hearts may be delivered, every one of us, young and old. In 2 Timothy 4, and verse 8, 18, And the Lord shall deliver me. This was his last letter. 
He knew that he was going to be de dying soon, and he was murdered by the Roman government. But even after he was killed, he knew the time of my departure of this life is at hand. I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I kept the faith. But even if I'm dead, he says, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Even though they slay my body, the Lord's going to deliver me and take me to heaven. And this is what the three Hebrew children said. Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, before they went into the fiery furnace, they said, the Lord will deliver us, and if not, we will not bow to you. We're not bow. If not. But the Lord is able. And the Lord did deliver them. Miraculously delivered them. There were, there were three that were cast down flat, and the king couldn't sleep that night because he wished he hadn't made that judgment. He went and said, Oh, Daniel, spare me wrong. All right, all right. Somebody went there. Where's there was the Daniel lines? Oh, got the lines mixed up. All right, so uh, somebody went to the, to the pit of Shadrach, me, Shadrach, Medic. Yeah. Someone went there and uh, they found, yeah, I got the wrong ones, the three and four, okay. Go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego <laughs> in the fiery furnace. Uh, there were four men, and the fourth was like unto the Son of God. The new versions say, a son of the gods. No, that's, that's Aramaic, but that's what it means, the Son of God. Just like Elohim in the Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. Elohim is a plural, uh, three or more, and that's it's plural, but it's translated as singular. The Son of God was there and delivered them. So he's able to deliver. And then in Hebrews 2, verse 14, For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he that is the Lord Jesus Christ also himself likewise took part of the same, and through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil. That's because of Calvary. He can destroy the power of the devil and deliver them. God is in the delivery business. Deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. God is faithful and can deliver. He delivered just Lot and reserved the rest of them uh, to damnation to be punished in the, in the lake of fire. Uh, let's read the next verse together. And verse number, number 10. Okay. But chiefly, them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous their days, sorrowful, not afraid to speak evil of dignity. Now, then they walk after the flesh, uh, despise government, uncleanness, these that are unsaved. Uh, the government, I think, that's referred to here is the government that's mentioned in Romans 13. There is a biblical government, a biblical definition of what government is. If you look at Romans 13, the first three or four or five verses, you'll see that according to God, just government, biblical government, condemns evil and praises the just and good. Not the reverse. What we have today in many governments, they praise the evil and hurt the good and lambaste and fine and put in prison. So despise proper government, proper biblical, presumptuous of their self-will, not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Uh, they, they blaspheme the Lord God of heaven and earth, the greatest dignity that there is. He's divine deity. Whether the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they swear by His name. I don't know whether they swear by the Holy Spirit, but they swear by God's name all the time. Uh, OMG is a swearing, they hear that all the time. Blasphemy on the boob tube and television as well as on the markets and the streets. We just had this supper last night and uh, I heard blasphemous Words coming out a couple a couple tables away, see? Blasphemy, using God's name. And Christ, they use that all the time. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they use His name in vain. And horrible. Uh, not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And uh, fill of uncleanness. In Matthew 23, 27, one of the eight woes the Lord Jesus told about the Pharisees, these religious leaders of His day. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, not politically expedient, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, whited tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within, full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. That's what these men, the lust of uncleanness, is speaking about here. These unsaved people, God is just, 
and sending them to the lake of fire. Uh, and then in Romans 1.24, speaking of the heathen world, God gave them up to uncleanness, to the lusts of their own hearts, to the sign of their own bodies between themselves. God had to destroy those evil people to start with and gave them up to the lust. Uh, probably in the Noah's flood is when they were judged. And then in Romans 6, verse 19, uh, Paul says that I speak at the manner of man in the firmity of your flesh. As you have yielded your members as servants to uncleanness, before you were saved, our members, these bodies that we have, uncleanness were yielded. Now, yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness, the opposite of uncleanness. All of our members, all ten of our members, two hands, two ears, two feet, uh, two eyes, one mouth, one heart. Yield ourselves to holiness. Galatians 5.19 Works of the flesh are manifest, not only adultery and fornication, but uncleanness is one of the works of the flesh. One of these 17. Dirty, filthy, uncleanness. In Ephesians 4, verse 19, these people who are unsaved, who being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work uncleanness with, with greediness. In Ephesians 5, verse 3, Paul says, to, to the believers there at, at Ephesus, the Christians there. Fornication, all uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Now why did Paul tell the Ephesus, the church at Ephesus that? Because the tendency apparently at Ephesus and any, every one of those early cities was to follow the heathen, follow them in fornication. Follow them in all kinds of uncleanness. Follow them in covetousness. But he says, you at the church at Ephesus, those believers, I don't want it to be named even one time among you as become of saints. Then Colossians 3, verse 5, Paul says again, mortify your members, which are upon earth, one of the members, uncleanness. Mortify, put to death. Morticians take care of dead bodies. And we should put to death the evil and among us, uncleanness is one of the things we should mortify. Then in 1 Thessalonians 4, and verse 7, God hath not called us unto uncleanness. We who are genuinely saved have not been called to uncleanness and filthy lives, but unto holiness. That's what God's called us to. And not to be self-willed. These people seem to be self-willed and uh, willing to do what they want to do. Uh, as it says right there in the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 7, now, one of the qualifications of pastor, bishop, elder, a uh, bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not self-willed. Willed to the Lord, but not self-willed. Not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy liver. These are qualifications of the pastor, bishop, elder, not self-willed. We must find the will of God in the words of God and we must do the will of God, not what we want, but what God himself wants, as we find it in his word. And dignities in Jude 8, uh, another instance of the same term, likewise these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, these evil people, despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. And uh, they don't want to talk about the Lord, they hate him, they despise him, and uh, it's a terrible thing indeed. Let's read verse number 11 together. For as angels, which are greater in power and might, reflect righteousness and before the Lord. See, now these evil people that are condemned to the lake of fire, God's going to take care of them. Even the angels, greater in power, they're not going to judge these people. Uh, they say, they don't bring accusations before the Lord. Uh, he's the one that brings the accusation. In fact, in Jude, verse 9, it talks about Michael, the archangel. When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked him. Angels are not going to rebuke the lost and unsaved people. It's going to be the Lord himself. It's going to be the judge. At the great white throne judgment of the unsaved and lost, the Lord Jesus will be there, and we will be behind him in our resurrected bodies, the saints of God, and we will be with him in that judgment. He'll be the judge also of the judgment seat of Christ for believers, saved people, Lord Jesus Christ. Not the angels, but the Lord himself. 
Well, this last, the first part of Second Peter talks about these four judgments. That they're just. A lot of people say we should never judge anybody, uh, but the Lord was just in His judgments. The judgment of the angels who had sinned grievously, they followed Satan. Just in the, the flood upon the wicked people in this earth, on which they hadn't even created man. Uh, he's Sodom and Gomorrah, he's just in judging Sodom and Gomorrah, with the wicked and filthy people. And the just in judging those unsaved lost people that have never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ genuinely. And so our God is just, and people that say he's unjust are just not, they don't know the scriptures. They don't know the scriptures. Uh, they think that everybody's, even though they've lived the lives of Satan, they think they all should take me, God should take him to heaven. See, well, if heaven's up there with evil people and good people, who wants to be in heaven? Mixed up with all the devil's crowds. See, I'm glad to get rid of the devil's crowd. I'm sure to go ahead and be with the Lord. Let's close with the word of prayer. Our Father, we thank thee for these four just judgments about His reign upon this world. We thank thee, Lord, that thou art just, thou art righteous. Thou dost never do anything that's wrong. All right, I'll run not say that right or that Christian and decent. We thank Thee for Thy greatness. Thank Thee for Thy goodness. We ask Thee, Lord, to help each one of us to love Thee and serve Thee that we may not be uh, as Lot was, grieved and wounded and hurt by the conversation of people, the way of life all around us, what we hear, what we see. Go with us and bring us back to our Bible study this afternoon. Take care of us and use us for Thy glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Take our hymnals again.